I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what I currently do. Um, Kieran mentioned yesterday in his uh, lecture that I based my PhD um, working on looking at these asymptotic expansions and doing semi-classical physics and trying to combine it with TFT. Uh, after doing that, I, I moved to Harney's group in, at the Max Planck in Halle. And I kept doing this for a while as well. <laughs> but I also got interested in um, finite temperature in DFT. And now, um, since January, I've moved on to the Sandia National Labs. And it's a great place because they allow me to work on functional construction. But also, at the same time, I can now run realistic simulations. Uh, and and test uh, what we construct, what we uh, come up with in, in theory, and apply to to realistic conditions and materials. And this talk is about work on this. It's about first principle stopping power in uh, ordinance matter. Originally, my title was beryllium, but I'll made it more general because I'll show uh, results on more materials than just beryllium. And uh, this is worked together with a postdoc I work with, Daniel Jensen, and another staff member, uh, Andrew Bacheski, who did, who spent years, uh, a few years, implementing most most of what I'm showing here uh, numerically. So, <coughs> stopping power in one manner. First question: Most of you, if you're beginning students you might not know what ordinance matter is. Uh, so what is that? Uh, ordinance matter is a highly energetic state of matter, and it's not, cannot be clearly defined. It is an intermediate state of matter between gas, liquid, solid, and plasma. And it is found naturally, in, for example, in the core of giant gas planets, so far away from Earth. So, for example, the Jupiter core. Um, Earth's core is not quite orbit matter. It is almost there, but not quite. And orbit matter is also produced on Earth experimentally in large facilities. And these are all related to, um, mainly related to fusion experiments. So our motivation for studying Warren's matter is that this would give us an understanding of the of planetary physics, such as understanding the formation of planets, or techno it has technological applications, such as achieving fusion under laboratory conditions, because on the path to ignition in a fusion reaction, you have to go through the Warren's matter regime. Um, you can define it a little more qualitatively, quantitatively, in terms of two parameters. One of them is the Coulomb coupling parameter, which is basically a ratio of um, the Coulomb potential energy and the kinetic energy. Or another parameter is the electron degeneracy parameter, which is the thermal energy of the system uh, the ratio of the thermal energy and the Fermi energy of the system. And when these two parameters are approximately one, we, we talk about Hormans matter. Maybe better, more intuitive units are uh, densities. When we achieve these kind of densities, we are often in Hormans matter, depending on the material, or temperatures between 1 and 100 electron volts. That corresponds to 10,000 to almost a million degrees in Kelvin. So, so this is what performance matters. Then, um, so how do we create performance matter? Uh, and so what what we have to do is we have to 
transfer an enormous amount of energy, and I'll get into that uh, in a moment, to a target material in a very short period of time. If we do that, we can achieve orbit summary conditions. And this is done on a few experimental facilities uh, in different countries. One of them is uh, at our lab at Celia. It's the C-machine. What this basically does is, is that it uh, pumps uh, large currents through wires and they explode and create torments matter. And that's like a very dramatic picture of uh, this facility. Another one I'd like to focus on today is this type of facility here. That's the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore National Labs. This is a different method to create dormant matter. And you see this is the target chamber. And how they achieve dormant matter is by laser beams. So you see here openings in this ch target chamber. And what they do is they focus a large number of uh, laser beams onto a target that is very small, microns in size, in the center. And they pump this energy into this target and that's in a very short amount of time and that creates formants matter. Uh, so specifically the, um, the, the, the calculations and the experiments uh, I focus on today are done in a facility like this, but not at the ignition facility, but at the Omega facility at Rochester University. But it uses the same technique. And now, let's get closer to the topic. So, first of all, what is stopping power? And that's a very old concept from the beginning of the 20th century. And it's basically the question, uh, the answer here is, what, when we shoot a projectile into a target, into a material, stopping power is the amount of energy deposited in that material or the loss of energy of that projectile when it travels through a target material. So the energy per unit per unit path length is a stopping power. And in, in regular matter, that is pretty much well understood. But here we're asking a different question. We're asking uh, to calculate the stopping power in Warman's matter. And that's the experiment uh, that has recently been done and which we're trying to uh, simulate. What they do here is they need to create, they need to prepare a source of projectiles, which is on the left here. And also they need to prepare the target material. They need to bring the target material to warm the smarter conditions. They do both of it by shining these laser beams onto these materials. So let's look at the first one. So we need to create projectiles that fly with a certain velocity into our target. What they do here is they have a small uh, a sphere filled with uh, deuterium and helium. And you see, uh, yeah, here it gives you the dimensions. It's 860 microns in diameter. That's the thickness. This is a shell. So they drive, they, they shoot 20 beams of laser. Uh, and actually, I had notes. <coughs> the laser has a wavelength of 350 nanometers. And they shoot this laser uh, onto this, um, this uh, sphere. And what happens is that Due to that, the, sh the sphere implodes and the fusion reaction occurs. And the fusion reaction creates alpha particles that travel then into the target. And the target is then also prepared with 30 beams, the same laser. And the target is uh, basically a plastic tube that is coated with silver. And in the interior, you have a beryllium plug. So that's our beryllium. And what happens here is when you shoot the laser on this material, um, you, you basically uh, create uh, emission from the L shell of the silver atoms. And that heats up 
the beryllium in the interior of this uh, of this tube and brings it to warm spider conditions. And to give you an idea of um, of the energy you transfer uh, during this process, I'll give you some numbers. So we, for example, for the proton source, the laser delivers 10 kilojoules in one nanosecond. So it takes one nanosecond to create a fusion reaction. And I don't know if you can, I can't really understand what this means. So let's switch to more human units. Uh, my preferred unit is one Mars bar. <laughs> You're familiar with them, the chocolate candy bars that are filled with caramel? <laughs> that contains about a thousand kilojoules per Mars bar. It's a lot. <laughs> so, but we deliver 10 kilojoules in one nanosecond. So, meaning that you would have to eat 600 million Mars bars per minute. <laughs> so, a minute, and you can have this amount of Mars bars to achieve this delivery of energy into the material. And if you did that, I think you would be pretty excited. <laughs> <laughs> and you can relate to these, uh, the material here. So this is what we're doing. This is the amount of energy. It's enormous. How long would it Sorry? How long would it How many nanoseconds? One, uh, one nanosecond. So it takes one nanosecond to create the future reaction. And also one nanosecond uh, to bring the beryllium to the bronze matter conditions. And the measurements are done in this time frame. It's not really a equilibrium, no. You would not call it, well, it's hard to define. Uh, and we, you'll see in the simulations, we'll make some assumptions on that. But that's the experiment. So it's a very fast experiment. Uh, so this is what we'd like to simulate. Uh, and you might be surprised that uh, we'll be using DFT time-dependent DFT and nuclear dynamics to simulate how these protons that fly into uh, the target material deposit energy. So what's the general setup of the experiment? And there are also some open questions. Um, so this experiment has, has been done last year, and now we'd like to simulate it and give them uh, We'd like to analyze them and give them all the predictions for future experiments. So, first thing we have to do is we have to create um, um, a configuration of nuclei in our system. These are the beryllium atoms. And it's debatable um, how we prepare that. One thing I didn't mention, this is a very specific process of heating that happens here, and it's called isochoric heating. So, meaning that in the seeding process, the uh, ions, the nuclei, don't move, but the heating is mediated by the electrons, which will be used as an assumption that we can, uh, and that's what we currently do and did first, is that we just take a configuration of beryllium atoms, and that's, that's the configuration of the atoms. It's debatable whether you should thermalize it to the given uh, electronic temperature that we achieve. And this is about 32 electron volts, so roughly 300,000 Kelvin in the target material. And also two things that need to be investigated. But we assume we start with this initial configuration of beryllium atoms. Then, then we create an um, initial electronic state. For this configuration, we solve the electronic structure at this given temperature of 32 electron volts. And then we add the projectile, which is the yellow dot here. And once you have done that, we do the time-dependent simulation. 
up to now we did either molecular dynamics or no molecular dynamics and just static DFT. What are typical velocities? So that yeah, so that depends. It is it ranges from the, the kinetic energy of these projectiles are kilo electron volt to mega electron volt. But it's not relative. So we stay be below the relativistic limit. So it can so they travel with about 0.01 C speed of light, these projectiles. And it can go up a little more, but we we stay below 10% of the speed of light typically. So we neglect in the calculations currently we neglect relativistic effects. If you say the kilo electron uh, water vision, you're fine doing that. So now this projectile travels fast, very fast through the material, and that's what we will also do in the calculation. We will take the projectile, give it an initial velocity, and it will move through the simulation cell, and we take a random position in a random direction, and because See there, we are doing a periodic calculation with periodic boundary conditions. So the projectile will leave the simulation box and then, you see, it's a periodic boundary condition, so it will enter here, leave here, uh, then enter here, leave there, and enter here. So we drive it through several times, such that we sample the entire simulation cell. So that's the setup. Um, now I need to reference the lectures which I'm going to use for this talk. <laughs> so I will use the first one, the Holmberg Cone Theorem lecture by now. You'll see because it's on the next slide. I'll use Kieron's lecture on the Concham equations, and then I'll use Harvey's lecture on time dependent DFT because we'll use time dependent DFT. So now let, let me give you now uh, connected to lectures and give you some of the theory. So to prepare the initial state, we do set it DFT. Ah, so we jump this. You have to watch it again. So, <laughs> so and we have learned about this in, in great lectures this one. So we know how we do steady Kunshan DFT. But what we're doing is at finite temperature, so we can't do that. But we can do something similar. So we generalize Concham DFT to finite temperature. And I'll just go quickly through that. So we have the same Hamiltonian as before, kinetic energy, electron electron interaction, external potential. But we have to work with the statistical density operator now, where these Ws are weights. And these are the many body wave functions. And then you write a grand potential operator that has the Hamiltonian, but also includes entropy, S, where tau is the temperature. And we have the particle number operator, and mu is the chemical potential. And then in right after the Concham paper, Merman generalize this to finite temperature. And that's uh, well, the home back home paper where we generalize this to uh, finite temperature. Where we, now we have this universal functional at a given temperature. And you now minimize over statistical density operators that give you a density. And you minimize the kinetic energy, the electron electron interaction, but also the entropy now. In addition. And then instead of having an energy, we have now the, the grand potential. And it is written in a very similar way if you compare it to the zero temperature case, where now but you have this new universal function that you minimize over. And you also include the chemical potential here. And to make, practical, to make practical calculations, we switch to the Cauchan scheme. And if you look at the equations, they're very similar. They're almost identical, except I just put a, a tau on certain quantities, like the Cauchan potential, and the energy. 
meaning that we can basically solve the Kronstadt equations at higher temperature, but we need to occupy according to the Fermi Dirac statistics. So Fi here, so we get the density from the Kronstadt orbitals by summing over the square of them, but multiplying the sum, well, multiplying each summit by the Fermi Dirac statistics that has a temperature dependence. And then, uh, again, the universal functional band is written in a very similar way. In addition, we have the entropy term. And another crucial difference is that the exchange correlation energy depends on the temperature, not just implicitly through the temperature dependence in the density, but it has an additional explicit temperature dependence. But that's another crucial point. And in all standard calculations, at finite temperature that are done, this temperature dependence of the exchange correlation energy, the explicit temperature dependence, is neglected. There are now very few functionals available. There's an LDA. But uh, up, to, up until now, this hasn't been used yet. And there's still work to be done here to understand and approximate this temperature dependence uh, in a better way. With this high temperature, do you really need to solve the problem or you can do Powell's formula? So if you go to high enough temperature, you can show the correlation energy goes to zero. And you could, if you go to very high temperatures, you can just solve Thomas Fermi theory. But Roman's matter is in a regime where you're not in that limit. So you need to take into account, um, you cannot go to Thomas Fermi. What temperature? It depends on the material. But typically, if you go to a million of Kelvins, and when you do plasma physics, you can use Thomas Fermi theory. But we're not, we're not really doing plasma physics. We're colder than plasma. And what makes, ah, another question. What are you doing with the Oh, ah, so the entropy, this is the non-interacting entropy, and you can calculate it um, from the Kuhn-Sharm uh, energy eigenvalues. So there's the diff I didn't define it here, I didn't give it here the definition, but you have uh, the non-interacting entropy you can write as this log term, including the Kuhn-Sharm eigenvalues. It, it will be in potential. Yes. It will be calculated here explicitly. Yes, and potential is the potential, the external potential? No. no. The, the Kuhn-Sharm potential. Well, the Kuhn-Sharm potential depends on temperature through the exchange and correlation. And it, so the correlation contribution to the entropy is in the Kuhn-Sharm potential. So this is, so here we'll, we're doing it, we're treating the entropy in the same way as we treat the kinetic energy. This is the Kuhn-Sharm entropy. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That should have a subscript S, saying this is the Kuhn-Sharm entropy. And the correlation part of the entropy is being treated through the exchange correlation energy So what makes this difficult is that you don't have, you have to solve for a large number of occupied Kuhn-Sharm orbitals due to the Fermi Dirac uh, statistics. And that makes these calculations very challenging and expensive compared to zero temperature calculations. Of course. Mm -hmm. So is this, uh, you almost always do that part when you do the calculations that you have to smear the equations. Yeah, you smear them, but here the smearing is very large. <laughs> okay. So then, yeah. We're, so very right. I mean, in principle, you, do, you should do the same thing. Yeah, you, well, often, yeah, for numerical reasons, this is done. But then if you really want to go to high temperatures, you need a very efficient numerical implementation. Um, and that makes it challenging. So typically, in this, in the calculations I'll show, you have to occupy about 4,000 bands to converge the calculation, just because of the only five minutes. It's five minutes and 30 minutes. OK. Perfect. OK. So then, that's this. Then we do time dependent. We need time dependent DFT. So I'll, let me not go into this. The only thing I'll say here is we use 
uh, the standard way, the adiabatic approximation to exchange a correlation. And we'll use LDA or, or a GGA. And then we need to also couple this with uh, the nuclear dynamics. And we do this dynamics here. And let us not look into it until <coughs> there are only five minutes left. Um, this is the important equation. This is the, these are the equations of motion, and this is the time dependent Poincharme equation. And the coupling is through the energy, the electronic energy. And, and, the, and we time evolve the nuclei by taking gradients of this energy. Okay. Um, just to give you an idea, the time step in the Electronic dynamic simulation is about an attosecond, maybe smaller. And usually in an MD simulation, you would have a time step of one attosecond. And um, I'll not go into the details. So Andrew Bachevsky did most of the implementations, and we have more capabilities of what we can calculate. And the electronic structure is solved with the VASP code that has been modified at Cyndia. Typically, you use hundreds of cores for a few hours or longer for these calculations. And now I'd like to show you this. So why do we do air infest dynamics on UPI? It's crucial for stopping power. Because, because as you'll see, Born-Oppenheimer, if you did a Born-Oppenheimer um, treatment of the UPI, you cannot capture stopping power. And you'll see this here. That's an actual calculation. If you did Born-Oppenheimer, you're always in the instantaneous ground state, and you're missing a crucial feature, which you see here when you do air-infest dynamics. So what we do here is we shoot uh, a proton through solid aluminum. This is called channeling because we go between the atoms. And you see what happens here. Here, this is basically a plus one excitation that you get when you do air-infest dynamics. And you miss that completely. Uh, then you do one up and have If you do go up and have, how do you define what your one state? Because one up and have the dynamics assume that you have to the dynamics on one particular state. If you have not only highly excited systems, so how can you even define a one electronic state that you follow? Oh you well you solve for the electronic structure at each time step instantaneous. Okay. And and that's what you do. And that's and it, and it, well and so you move the proton through the system and at each time step, if you did Born Oppenheimer you would solve the electronic uh, system and calculate from that uh, assuming point particles the the forces on, on the nuclei. And why did you go for air based dynamics? Because, uh, because of this feature here, because it is. Yeah, but you could also do self solving. Oh, you could do that. It's even, but that's even more complicated. I guess it's a little bit more expensive. Exactly. So you can do that, and maybe we'll do it at some point, but this is, let's say, the most feasible approach we can do that will give us some a reasonable result. So now we come to. There were questions. When you say form of a hundred dynamics, you really mean the single equilibrium in the atomic state. Exactly. Not, not one class state. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You said semi equilibrium. No. Semi equilibrium. The thermal state in that. Thermal equilibrium, yes. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no energy transfer between the projectile from the imagine. Well, there is yeah, you see there is almost no no energy transfer. So there's a tiny bit, but almost nothing. Whereas if you did air infest dynamics, you get that because you're on an average potential energy surface that takes somewhat non-adiabatic effects into account. In the thermal, it's also an average too, right? It's an average. A thermal average. Yes. A thermal average, you mean in the sense of? In the form of a you, you are, yeah, this is at, uh, well, at uh, thermal equilibrium, this calculation. So now, what do we get? 
So now we did this, now this is a different example. This is hydrogen, projectile in hydrogen. Uh, so how much time do I have left? Oh, this one. Oh, I'm sorry. So yeah. So basically, I'll, uh, that's, uh, that's a shame. So in the end, we obtain this curve. That's the stopping power curve. And basically what you see here, that's the stopping power for different projectile velocities. And that's the typical curve you get. And we don't have the experimental result yet. The experiment is only one point here, and we haven't calculated the experiment yet. So we are going to predict this curve, uh, and there will be future experiments at different uh, ion velocities, projectile velocities, and then we will see how well we will, we will really do. And I end here, and I'll say a few more things with the questions. If I have Why did you need TDDFT? Why did it give you rather than ground state DFT? Because you are interested, you want to see, well, you want to uh, look at the, you want to time propagate the electrons as well. So you have the electrons in the material, you have the electrons um, in the projectile, and well, of course, you could do everything static, but we are trying to push as much as we can and use the highest level of theory possible for these materials. This has to do with the fact that you use the air instead afterwards. Exactly. So we need time-dependent DFT and we have coupled to air to Um You said you use a DLT. Yeah. Uh, but well, the exchange correlation has some part of entropy here as well. Yes. Well, no. Uh, the exchange part, no. Exchange has no entropy. Well, the correlation. No. The correlation. Well, no. Well, no, we did not do that. So we used a, a ground state exchange correlation functional. That's so that's the zero temperature approximation of higher temperature DFT. Use the ground state functional like PV, for example, or LDA. And use it, and you know you make you ne you're neglecting the okay. entropic contribution, but that's what we can do. We can do more. Um, if you calculate the uh, stopping power, how many trajectories do you usually take for the average? Um, so we're running these calculations currently, so we we don't know exactly many. We will have to run many calculations, and then sample them. And typically, it will be of the order of 10, 20, 30. Something like this. So that's. When you evaluate after the distance of, of, part, uh, of the uh, sample, this uh, sample is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So all you have to decide how long do you want to let this trajectory run? How many different trajectories do you sample? These are all parameters you decide when you do the simulation. And you have to do many simulations at different energy, projectile energies, to get this curve. Um, so it's all roughly in the, so the beryllium experiment was about 32 electron volts. The aluminum, I don't know if I said it was printed here. I think it was not printed here. It's at the order of, um, okay, I was just asking if there is transfer. Um, this I'm not sure, but you are, these conditions are very extreme such that the electron and nuclear dynamics can be on the same time scale. About the experimental set, is that uh, purely academic in nature or what's the application at NIF? The application at NIF is the inertial confinement fusion. So they want to understand the heating process of an inertial confinement fusion capsule. capsule because the warm dense matter target. So actually, in the experiment, uh, if I go back, mm -hmm. the, the fusion capsule is something like this. And when it implodes, you have protons going through the material. So you want to understand what happens, 
how, how much energy do the protons transfer into the material? Of the capsule, of the capsule oh, itself. Oh, so the okay. fusion experiment is basically just this year. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a few comments on some of the comments in the background of the thermal, thermal DFT. So on the lighthouse question about the Thomas Fermi. So I think at around beyond about 300,000 Kelvin, it's almost impossible to converge your cone channel calculation because the number of orbitals that are contributing becomes very, very high. So at that point, people start using Thomas Fermi type theories. But in fact, the temperature at which Thomas Fermi theory becomes reasonably accurate, I think, is much, much higher because it misses all the details of the electronic structure that you purposely built in with the home channel calculation. So there's this big sort of gap in temperatures. Um, but people in the labs don't seem to really realize this. But they've kind of nothing else that they can do at the moment as yeah. you're working on. You're welcome. So we're working on uh, uh, improving your theory. Uh, also, so there are two experts of coupled electron nuclear dynamics here. Nipah and Hardy. So also that, uh, as I, I learned here at the workshop, there's a correction to Ehrenfest dynamics. No? That is something that can also be applied. And no. about this other issue about the missing the thermal effects and the exchange correlation. Last year we were able to show, to show that as you heat it up, the cone sham pieces become larger and the exchange correlation pieces don't, so that their relative contribution becomes smaller as you increase the temperature. So even the zero temperature approximation becomes relatively exact at high temperatures, just because exchange correlation becomes. I mean, it doesn't look at zero, but it becomes. Uh, actually, yeah, no, it goes to zero in the district correlation. Should we close the zero? How about the just the correlation to the Yeah, it's all together. Well, it's, it's of the same order as the correlation to the So I, so now, okay, there's a reference for that. You need to find it. Yeah, I know it becomes relatively small. I'm not sure that it's absolute value for this. Is there a reference that you use? Yeah, there's the code. It's on the yes. I told you, yeah. It's in a book chapter. It's in. Oh, yeah. I'll find it. That would be very really useful for us. Okay, that's my comment. So your starting power has a maximum achievement. Yeah. So what is the explanation for that maximum? So yes, so it it is also found in classical stopping power, and this is called rag peak, the maximum. And it has to do with the processes that occur when the projectile transfers energy. When it's very slow, the projectile, the beginning of the curve, it transfers less energy. It's mainly um, collisions with the nuclei and the target material. When you're very high, it moves so fast through the material that it cannot really transfer that much energy, so it doesn't lose much energy. And these effects are then often relativistic or radiation effects. And the interesting regime is exactly where Roman's matter is, that's here in the middle. And these are mixtures of effects where it transfers energy through different channels. Both of them that happen, like also ion collisions happen, but you also have partial ionization in the medium, in the target. The projectile loses energy through that. Um, it's a um, question. Okay. So mainly partial ionization. The band structure is important. Uh, for example, so there. Are the electronic structure is the main mechanism uh, in this intermediate regime. 
So what you're doing here is ultimately a mixed quantum classical treatments. Yeah. The complete system of electrons and exactly. Now, once you do that, then it is really well known a huge problem that exactly what you want to describe, namely the energy transfer between the subsystems of electrons and nuclei, is actually not properly described if you do air dynamics. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So this okay. isn't the problem. So basically we do this because that's what is feasible currently. But of course we want to apply more refined methods like the exact vectorization. Well, that's what I was driving at. Exactly. It's also a mixed quantum classical algorithm. Exactly. So it's exactly this energy transfer that is when this yeah. So in this particular experiment I was emphasizing the isochoric heating. So we know experimentally that they, the nuclei don't move as much as they could in other heating mechanisms. That's why we think maybe this is fine to do and we'll see once we have the experiments available. But ultimately in the general case there are other heating mechanisms like at the C machine where the nuclei might move wildly at the same time as well as the electrons for example. And then we would need higher level uh, methods. If you call this a vector, does that mean that um, the wave vector of the incoming particles is on the order of the first maximum in the structure no. network? Um, I think that's right. So that yeah, the wavelength, the wavelength the is somehow related to the spacing, and the spacing. And that's how also the experiment has to be designed if you want to heat a bit of heat. So uh, that's right. And it's a challenge to create uh, proton sources that deliver the right, that have the right wavelength and deliver the right amount of energy. <laughs> As far as I understand, yes. So it's part of the universal functional. Like if you remember the slides, um, yes. Well, but it's not, yeah, it is part of the exchange correlation free energy that includes the, kin the entropic contribution, entropic correlation contribution, in the same way as at zero temperature the correlation energy contains the kinetic correlation energy. So let's thank Attila again.